This is Michael T. Bradley. Welcome back to Realms Remembered. As promised, let's talk about the Black Bouquet and Dawn of Night, both of which take place in 1373. So first, let's talk about the Black Bouquet. Richard Lee Byers, not one of my favorite authors to begin with, slowly kind of my heart is warming to him, yet I don't really know why. His stuff is never revolutionary or extremely interesting, yet I keep reading it. I keep, for some reason, thinking that bigger things will happen, yet they don't. Uh, Black Bouquet is essentially about, it's one of the, uh, the, the Thieves or, or the Rogues series. It's about a thief who tries to pull off this really big crime, almost gets away with it even though all of his party is murdered, and then it's kind of him, you know, trying to get the item that he was trying to steal, which is this book called The Black Bouquet, Bouquet, if you will, and, and trying to make as much money off of it as possible then how he kind of winds up with the person who killed all of his friends, who, you know, it, the item keeps kind of bouncing between all these different people, and then this priest of super black death gar or whatever who wants everything to end, and I, I don't know, she might be a follower of Char, doesn't matter, she's... It's, I, I, I kept picturing uh, Sinead O'Connor, uh, but like, I don't know, with, uh, with Robert Smith's personality... And we're in a city, I can't remember the name of the city. I, it's so frustrating because it wasn't that long ago that I read this book and I didn't dislike it, but it's just so incredibly forgettable, which is my main problem. Yet I made it all the way through. But the city is just, it's, it's kind of like, boy, their city sucked. It was really, really bad. Nobody looked out for anybody else. It sucked. Like, they just go through that time and time and time again, and it's like, all right, I, I get it. The city, city kind of sucks. All right, let's, let's move on, Richard. I guess the positives about this book in general is that it points out that most of the lower level realm of books that they're putting out at this point in the series, or at this point in the, the uh, franchise, are still pretty decent. Yet, you know, there are a couple that I've skipped third uh, edition, but for the most part, I'm reading all the way through even the ones where I'm like, I don't have anything to say about this, you know? And, and so I think that's a lot better than we were doing in second edition. I wouldn't say that this really points out anything exciting about rogues. I, you know, it's like there's a priest character that plays pretty heavily that I found interesting, and the city is talked about quite a bit, so it felt like it really could have gone under cities, or whatever they call the priests, just as easily. You know, I mean, obviously the main character is a rogue, but eh, that doesn't seem in intrinsic to the plot at all. I, well, I, I mean, I, I guess I should say that that doesn't override the plot at all. And uh, some of the other books, like especially Temple Hill, seems far more about priests than it does the city. So it's, you know, it, it seems so easily kind of convertible that whatever. I mean, I, I guess you learn about rogues in this, but not in some sort of degree that's massively different than a non-rogue book, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. I mean, I don't care. They gotta, you know, I, I assume that the one-off books do not sell as well as the books that have an overarching idea behind them, so whatever. But yeah, I just, I, <laughs> you know, it's weird. I don't think I've ever found myself in this position. I'm thinking about the book right now, and I'm like, God, I have absolutely nothing to say. I don't even remember exactly how it ends, even though I enjoyed it well enough and didn't skim that much. It's just utterly forgettable, which I guess is kind of a bad review. Yeah, so probably skippable. Let's talk about Dawn of Night, part two of the Erebus Kale trilogy by Paul S. Kemp. Now, as you all know, I was very, very excited about uh, part one, Twilight Falling. I had some trepidation coming into this because I had not read any of this before, and I was worried, you know, was Kemp just a one-hit wonder? Did this, uh, you know, did, the, did my excitement... Uh, Wayne here, and sadly the answer is yes, though I still made it through this book, and there, it, it gets a lot better towards the end. Uh, the beginning, the prologue, I think, is one of the most interesting parts. We, we go to, the, from the Sojourner's point of view, who's the kind of big bad for this trilogy, and we see exactly, or almost exactly, what he's trying to do and how he's trying to accomplish it. And, and so, you know, that was enjoyable because it's like, okay, we get most of the mystery out of the way up front so that we can focus on the story because it, it would kind of suck to go through this entire thing and just be wondering, well, what about this? What about that? You know, what does this mean? Uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We get that out of the way and we know exactly why he wanted the weave tap in book one or, or almost why. I'll be honest, I've forgotten now, but um, 
I didn't, it, I, I didn't forget it because <laughs> it was still a mystery. I think I just forgot it because it didn't really matter to me or whatever. So, so that was interesting. Then we go through an incredibly long portion of our main party in the shadow world, and that feels like it goes on forever. And it's a lot of Erebus doing navel gazing, which in general I enjoy, but it just didn't feel like anything new was found out or talked about in that entire section. So that just went on for far too long. It's like, you know, Erebus wonders, am I still a man? Jack wonders, how far am I willing to go? Is this darkness starting to affect me? Drasic doesn't really care and says, Erebus, you're a moron. You can get us out at any time, etc., etc., etc. And the uh, the Sionis is like, hey, I'm just here for the ride. It's cool. Then eventually we start slipping back or skipping over to the Slods, seeing what they're doing. And essentially they've got this huge plot that's going on in Skullport, which I really like Skullport. I felt like it was just a fun place with a lot of interesting rules. And I like the fact that the slots weren't just like, you know, a lot of times to show how badass your characters are, they just don't care about the laws of a town. And in Skullport, everybody's like, don't piss the skulls off, okay? Uh, Skullport reminded me a lot of, I, I swear it was a Drizzt book where they were underground and there was a, um, what was it, Beholders or something else I want to say, and there was, there was some big climactic battle like on a cliff with one of them, uh, at least, and, and it was like a multi-level battle. I don't know. I honestly don't remember, but I remember that image very strongly. And it, it reminded me a lot of that town, even though uh, the skull's very different than the things they fought there. But yeah, a fun place. But it just felt like the first half of the book is Erebus's party kind of bitching and moaning and the slods killing people. And it was like, is this going anywhere? And then, thankfully, the second half of the book did go somewhere. It, it felt it started to gain momentum. There were some really interesting character beats, especially once they got to Skullport. You know, Erebus has a, a woman who he interacts with, and it's not exactly romantic, but there there's just this connection between them. And it really felt like, oh, you know, I like this. I like seeing this side of Erebus. And, you know, I, I thought that interaction with that woman explored the side of Erebus where he's torn between his humanity and his shade manity. I don't know, his inhumanity, I guess. I, I thought that that scene did it so much better than the first half of the book altogether, you know? Like, it just, it, it seemed like he can he can do these things without, he, he can show without telling, and he's so much better when he does that. And I don't know if he just wasn't confident enough as a writer at this point, or if he just kind of realized, oh, crap, I have 80 pages of material and I gotta fill 300. I, I don't know. It just did, uh, it, it was very frustrating. And then, of course, Tracy Griven throwing down over a dog. That's the best scene by far of this book. I find myself really liking Drasic and the tiefling psionicist probably more than Erebus, and I still really like Erebus. It's not that Erebus has become boring, it's just that I'm like, I really want to know what's up with Drasic and, oh, I cannot remember his name. I think it starts with an M, but the tiefling psionicist. I'm like, these guys... Uh, you know, I, I these are the guys that I really want to follow. I'm getting a little frustrated by how invincible our slods seem. I think they take out one more in this, but it's like they keep almost, almost, almost taking out one or two of them each time, and I'm kind of like, come on. Azrim or uh, the other one whose name I'm blanking on now, one of them has to get taken out. And, uh, of course, the big thing about this, the, the big thing that ends this off you know, the first one got ended off with Erebus becoming a shade. This one ends off, stop now or skip ahead of 30, 40 seconds if you don't want to avoid spoilers, with Drasic turning on him. I thought this was really interesting because I totally didn't see that coming in the way that they were interacting. It did not feel like that made sense at all. So I really want to know, is Drasic playing the good guy? You know, is this a uh, Snape from Harry Potter sort of thing that's going on here? Or is he really turning on them? Which doesn't make any sense to me. You know, I think he saw that this was kind of the only way to go forward with them, but he's playing a real dangerous game here, if that's the case. We'll see. So yeah, by the end, I was really enjoying it. I'm very, very curious to see how this trilogy wraps up. There are just so many things that I am intrigued by and uh, that, that draw my interest here. Next time, let's talk about definitely Lady of Poison, and uh, we'll, we'll kind of maybe skip around uh, at that point uh, from there. So I'll see you next time. 
This is Michael T. Bradley, Realms Remembered.